Good morning. Hi. Oh, everyone said good morning back. That's great. Doesn't always happen. Thanks, guys. Um, my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I direct the energy program here at CSIS, and we're delighted to have all of you here this morning. Um, we were just chatting upstairs. Apparently, uh, in many parts of the world, this is the Harvest Fall Festival Day. So if that's your thing, happy Harvest Fall Festival. It's also International Energy Efficiency Day, so happy Energy Efficiency Day. <laughs> Uh, and there also happens to be, I think, three electricity-oriented hearings on the Hill this week. So uh, we planned this a long time ago. So intuitively, we just could sense that this was Electricity Week, uh, I, I suppose. And so we're really pleased to be on theme uh, rather than talking about oil markets, which sometimes we're doing uh, in these rooms. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, electrification. And I need to do a couple disclaimers uh, for the series that we run on energy and development, electrification means something a little bit different. It means providing energy access to people, right? It means electrifying villages and those sorts of things. And this isn't what we're talking about in this session. This session is more the idea that electricity through different technologies and uh, solutions penetrates into different sectors of the economy. Uh, and what we are finding is that in a lot of the work that we've been doing, people are talking more and more about this concept of electrification. So if you look at an outdoor greenhouse, I'll give you an example of some work that's going on just today. A 50-acre greenhouse, hydroponic, hydroponic indoor ag. It's using the flue gas from a combined cycle power plant. Guess what flue gas has? CO2. Guess what plants need? CO2. It's using the water discharge from that plant. Guess that what, what the water discharge has? Phosphorus. It's actually not good to discharge that. But guess what the plant needs? It's uh, nutrition for the plant. And guess what the steam does? It controls the environment in the greenhouse. So you have a power plant now that is actually producing other things that are being used for indoor ag. And take this forward next step. So let's say you have a power plant. When we talk about, you have heard about flexibility right now. Power plants are running up and down. And there are, you know, when the wind is blowing and it's not running, and when the wind is not blowing, then it's running. We call it flexible operation. But imagine a flexible operation where you have a desalination plant and a power plant co-located. So when you have excess power and you don't need the electricity, you're actually making fresh water. Uh, imagine a future where you're taking that excess electricity, whether it's coming from excess wind and excess solar, and you're actually creating hydrogen and syngas, and you're creating clean biofuel. So when you look at all these things that you're imagining, which is actually happening in some scale or form throughout the world, there are three things that are common. One, two of them are obvious that are common. One is they're all integrated. So we're looking at a system that is not looking at electricity, gas, petroleum, biofuels in all different ways. It's an integrated system. We're thinking about energy, not just electricity. And the missing piece is the subtext behind all this imagination is a comprehensive digital network that is now overlaid with the energy network. So the information communication technology, data analytics, digital, is now part of the entire network. And I'll ask you to imagine another thing. So imagine many of you have heard about smart meters. Well, one of the things that smart meters need is a telecommunication network to bring the data back to the hub. So imagine that smart meter, your gas company and your water company in five, 10 years from now, they want to also do smart water meter, smart gas meter. Can you not use the same communication overlay if it was designed right? Imagine your city wants to build a smart city and you want air quality, air quality monitors in the city. You want video surveillance in the city. Can you not use the digital overlay that's happening in the electricity grid and actually share that? Because if you do that, at the end, society is paying less for what has happened. So this whole concept of looking at the system in a more holistic way is what Integrated Energy Network is all about. And I'll just end up with three technology innovation and three policy innovation that we think is essential to move forward with that pathway. Uh, for the technology innovation, I think one of the key technology innovation that is needed, and it's more than technology, it's we need to figure out this whole concept of interoperability, which is if we are going to have your water heater and fuel cells and microgrid all playing in the same ecosystem, the way we communicate, the way we talk with them, there needs to be a standardization of languages. There needs to be a standard protocol to run this. 
Um, we think energy storage is a huge need for electrification. And if you look at electrification, imagine a future where your transportation network and your electric network are completely intertwined. And imagine there is a communication network on top of both, so you're being able to charge the cars at the right time. And so how this evolves, uh, energy storage will play a big, big role in it. And the third piece would be uh, something that we don't talk about now, carbon capture and storage. Because fuel, fossil fuel will still be a part of the ecosystem, whether you're using uh, syngas produced from renewables, but the way gas will be used, the way petroleum would be used, you know, if we don't get into carbon capture and storage, and if that's not viable, and that's not just for coal, that's gas, that's any other fossil fuel, then that becomes, uh, we're not going to get to that future. Policy regulation, three policy innovation that we think is needed. The biggest one is energy efficiency. Energy efficiency has been great for the society and it will continue to be great, but we need to change some of the fundamental way that we think about energy efficiency. First, energy efficiency needs to be energy neutral. So what does energy neutral mean? means in most of the states, you can do energy efficiency, but you have to stick to the fuel. So you can replace a gas furnace with a more efficient gas furnace. But you cannot replace a gas furnace with a more efficient heat pump and call it energy efficiency. If you replace a diesel forklift truck in Amazon warehouse with an electric or a hydrogen fuel cell forklift truck, that's not considered energy efficiency in most states. So energy efficiency needs to be fuel neutral and energy efficiency needs to be defined the right way. So what does it mean right way? So if I change, I'm going to give you a small example. If you have a lawn and if you have a lawnmower. So if I change my lawnmower from a two-stroke polluting diesel engine or gasoline engine to an electric lawnmower, which by the way, you can get it now because storage is becoming much, much, much more uh, and from a performance point of view, from a cost point of view. Have I changed the BTU need for mowing my lawn? I'm not sure, most likely not, energy need. But have I significantly reduced air quality emissions coming from point sources throughout the neighborhood? Absolutely, we have. So how do you define energy efficiency? Is it reducing emissions? Imagine a paper mill where you have a big roll of paper that you're drying and using steam dryer. The steam is using water. Imagine you're using infrared or microwave drying industrial to dry that paper. Now you're saving water. And if you're in California or if you're in other places where you're water challenged, electrification means now water savings. So we think a fundamental thinking is and rethinking is needed in how we define energy efficiency. And the second policy piece that I think what would be needed more on the electric grid side, we have been building a grid and we have been paying for the grid based on how many kilowatt hour or energy we use. If you're old enough, if you remember our AOL days, uh, we used to write emails offline because it used to cost us per minute. And then we would sync up and the email would go. Uh, guess what you do today? You pay $90 per month, even if you don't use your internet even for one second, or if you're using it for 365 days every day. They have changed their business model because in order for the electric grid to work in this complex system, you not only need energy, you need the capacity, you need the flexibility, you need inertia. There's a lot of technical terms that are out there and you need to make sure that those are being valued, not just the energy that's lighting your light. So with that, I'll kind of give you a broad context of what IEN is, it's an integrated energy network, what are some of the key innovation technology-wise that would be needed, and what are some of the policy innovation that would be needed uh, for this uh, pathway to happen. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I took a big risk this morning. I sent along some slides very late, my fault. And so Ian is under, uh, Ian has had to go to the trouble of transferring them. So, fingers crossed, uh, they made it. Um, so, I'd like to start by saying, first and foremost, that I think the, um, you know, Arshad's comments there, uh, they're comments that I tend to subscribe to in terms of a, a transition forward. Um, however, uh, my charge, I think, um, for this piece was to just reflect a little bit on some of the challenges that we're facing today, I think, in trying to make this transition. And, um, you know, I think they're quite significant, actually, in many respects. 
So first and foremost, I think it's useful to reflect on where we are in terms of a, a global economy or even a national economy from an energy usage point of view and what that might look like going forward. Um, so this is just a graph that kind of illustrates a CO2 emissions profile, where we are today, some paths forward and so on. And um, the main point that I want to draw out here is that if we break down the economy and we look to the future, under any scenario, for example, that there's any meaningful effort uh, to mitigate CO2, for example, what you'll see is that electricity and the electricity sector is the key vector for change initially. And that change is going to be very profound and very quick, actually. So, you know, if we were to, for example, try to stay on a, a Paris pathway, um, we're talking about very, very appreciable 50% or more alteration in, in, in emissions profiles over the next 15 or 20 years in the U.S. alone. And to do that is, of course, an enormous challenge given the inertia uh, that the system has. However, I think it's important to appreciate that we're already rapidly changing the nature of the power system. Uh, today, without a doubt, uh, investment in things like wind and solar um, at, a, at a kind of individual plant level are really very compelling in many markets in the United States. And you see that last year, for example, 70% of all the new generation that was installed was, was, was wind and solar. With that said, there are, other, there are two other salient uh, movements, I suppose, taking place in the power system, and Arshad mentioned two of them. There's a trend towards decentralization, or at least we now have a pathway towards greater decentralization with storage, with distributed energy resources more broadly, and there is this question and this movement towards much greater digitization. And what that is doing is it's really altering entirely how we can provide electricity. And, and I think Arshad has done a very interesting and very nice uh, job of describing some of the impacts, positive impacts that that can, that, that can lead to. With that said, there were a number of kind of outcomes from those, from those stressors on the system that are challenging. So if you look upstream, uh, the integration of these new types of resources results in really meaningful issues with respect to markets. We have some of that going on, discussions about that going on today. I think we have to think very carefully about that. We have to think about the grid and how the grid is going to operate given the new nature of these assets, both the intermittent assets and distributed assets more broadly on the system. And then, of course, we have to consider the issues of this prosumer paradigm and how actually that can be, tr that can be embraced. Uh, whilst at the same time ensuring kind of uh, that the, the regulatory compact and so on that we've relied on for a long, long time can be maintained. I'm sure Ken will speak to some of that. So this is a complex tapestry of issues. Um, w regardless, though, of how complex it is, I think we're on a path forward that is going to kind of take us uh, in that direction. So if you look at things like the cost of uh, wind and solar energy, you're seeing that that's falling year on year. This is just an illustration of how the cost of solar PPAs at scale in the United States has fallen up until very recently. And over the past you know, half decade, we've seen uh, prices uh, fall by more than half. And, and today, certainly, investment in things like new solar PV in uh, sunny parts of the country are the most compelling, the most cost-effective means of bringing new, uh, new uh, energy generation online. But along with that, we also have other trends taking place. And I think one very important one, and I think one that's going to potentially be a challenge, actually, for electrification more broadly, is the fact that, of course, we now also have a, a very large a new shale resource that's going to be around for a very, very long time. It's going to be a very competitive resource. And the idea of electrifying the economy has to kind of exist in juxtaposition to the use of things like, uh, like gas as primary fuels. And I think there's a tension there that uh, hasn't really been drawn out. So, for example, in the industrial sector, is electrification really a viable pathway? Given the rate of turnover of assets in those sectors, uh, given the cost effectiveness of natural gas, for example, for providing heat heat services, and so on and so forth. So we're going to have to explore how that plays out, and, uh, and certainly I think it's going to be less clear-cut than many would suggest. The other issue that I think is extremely important to bear in mind is that, <clears throat> and, and with, with Secretary Perry's uh, proposed rulemaking and so on uh, this, past, uh, this past week, we're, we're walking into this issue right now, um, is the fact that our markets today <clears throat> in the power sector are very dysfunctional. Um, uh, are increasingly so, certainly. And that's because we're adding a lot of the uh, out-of-market requirements for things like solar, and because we have very low-cost gas. 
and we're seeing rents that have been responsible and that are fundamental to the structure of our power markets to support capacity, for example. Those rents have been going away effectively over the past couple of years. And that's leading to a situation today where I think it becomes increasingly complicated to understand where are we going to find the dollars in order to pay for the capacity going forward to support, uh, to support greater electrification. Now, certainly, I think there's a lot of work ongoing already in trying to move towards a, a more fit-for-purpose market paradigm, um, but that's going to be a very complex and quite a slow process. Uh, California is an interesting example of this right now, today. You know, if you look at California on the real-time power market, for example, there are regularly instances at the moment of negative pricing in California, uh, owing to a lot of their uh, low, uh, you know, their low carbon intermittent generation, particularly from solar, and leading to an outcome where gas units are actually paying to stay on during certain hours to be available for the, for the ramp up later in the afternoon. This is just not a sustainable uh, outcome going forward. So we're going to have to really rethink those fundamental institutional structures. Um, I think it's possible, but I think it's going to be quite challenging. The, the other issue, and I do think that this actually tees or kind of aligns well with the kind of concept of greater electrification, is the fact that with these new types of resources, we're going to have to have much greater flexibility on the system. So that flexibility uh, can be delivered in many ways, things like transmission offer it, flexible generation, but personally, and coming from our work at MIT, I think increasingly what you're going to see is a paradigm, as uh, Arshad described, where you're moving more towards a distributed system, a more digitized system, where the flexibility now is embedded uh, almost at the customer level. And frankly, that there are value pathways for, 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 for supporting that if we can get market designs and regulation right. Um, that, that effort towards thoughtful market design, we're already seeing, I should say, from a positive note, some steps towards this. The energy imbalance market, I think, in California, in CAISO, is an interesting example. CAISO has done a very nice job, I think, of trying to open up activity, our engagement with uh, WEC more broadly to reduce their costs for in, uh, integrating um, uh, renewables on the system um, and the energy imbalance market is a really a small-scale effort but it is saving a lot of money and I think it's demonstrative of what can be done and personally I think we're, we're going to see more of that. The other side of the coin that I just want to briefly address is of course something that's uh, top of mind for many and that is electrification, electrification of mobility. And by the way, and I'm sure you're following this, uh, over the last year or two, the predictions with respect to electrification and the rapidity of it have really become much, much more bullish, much more, more bullish. Uh, this is just some data from Bloomberg who do, who do a good job, I think, but quite, a, quite an optimistic job in many respects about how the global uh, light duty sales uh, might progress over the next uh, you know, 20, 25 years and so on, and what that might mean for electricity demand. And, you know, in a nutshell, they're predicting that in, within 23 years, we're going to have half a billion electric vehicles in the global fleet, many of them here in the United States. So clearly that is a, that's a very interesting and that will be an impactful outcome. Um, and I should stress that we're already arriving at a frontier where electric vehicle technology, perhaps not the economics quite, but electric vehicle technology can deliver the mobility services we require. Um, there was some very interesting work recently just looking at typical light duty vehicle usage in the United States. And even a Nissan Leaf will, uh, will suffice for delivering about 90% of our, of our mo mobility needs. So we're getting very close already. So I do believe that the, the kind of the narrative surrounding mobility, uh, electrification of mobility being very real is, is correct. Um, from a battery technology point of view, since I have to bring an MIT slide, I suppose, every now and again, um, that's, I, I, we're getting very close there, too. So there's been a lot of progress with respect to battery cost reduction, and I would say that we're within about $75 now uh, of where we need to be to have an electric vehicle be cost competitive with $50 oil. Now, uh, that's exciting, and a lot of people use that as a kind of a, as a, a pillar upon which to build this narrative. Uh, my final slide is just a cautionary slide with respect to this. And that is that 
if we look to electrification more broadly, and particularly the engagement of individual agents in electrification, um, you have to consider issues that are more complex than purely the kind of uh, basic economics. You have to layer in the behavioral economics. And in the adoption of electric mobility or electrified mobility in particular, these are very, very complex uh, issues. So they're, they're questions of how people will actually want to charge their vehicles. Not how we envisage them being able to ideally charge it, but how people will actually do it. And we're seeing some very interesting data coming out of Norway already where they have some appreciable uh, penetration about patterns which are a little bit different than one would expect. The availability of infrastructure, even if that infrastructure is underutilized, is an issue. right? And who's going to fund that and so on. And then that all flows back ultimately into what the offerings look like. And then finally, with this little graph here, or uh, with this little map, this is a map just showing spatial variation in adoption of hybrids and EVs. And very clearly, there is a complex political economy to all of this. You know, there are peer effects, there is the, uh, the, 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 the policies, the local political persuasions, and so on. And I think we have to bake all of that into any vision going forward of electrification. Um, so, you know, three very brief conclusions, or two or three at least for me. So first... Um, you know, the system must change and the system is already beginning to change. Uh, and that's exciting because electrification can do a lot of things uh, very effectively, one of them being a, a mechanism for addressing the, the climate issue. Uh, secondly, the technologies that are enabling this, they are, they are around, but, uh, but it's going to take a lot of time to integrate, for example, that IT that's necessary into the system. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of time, I think, to convince regulators to pay or to allow for that, uh, for that infrastructure to be paid. That is not going to be a cheap exercise. And the third point is that I think we have to be very careful about making assumptions about how people are going to react to this, how they're going to consume those services. Evidence suggests that it might be more complicated than one would imagine. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. And thank you very much, sir. Okay, Frank was our sort of optimistic pessimist on the topic, which was good, which is good. And then Ken, thanks. Great, and just hit the arrows, I trust here. Oh, good, good. Um, uh, Sarah, thanks so much for inviting us here. It's rare that uh, I have both the combination of very much like-mindedness and uh, an appreciation of the challenges that I'm called on to deliver. Um, but the, the wisdom that was just shared uh, by our two uh, prior speakers, I very much concur with, so we are like mind. By way of introduction, uh, just a couple of other points. RAP is a group of veteran regulators, uh, so we've been in those shoes, and I like to characterize our work as advising current regulators, mostly PUCs, but also environment departments and others, state energy offices and so forth. Uh, and, and we advise them about how to avoid making the same mistakes that we made when we were in their chairs. Um, I made my mistakes as air director in New Hampshire and then subsequently at NESCOM, a regional air quality group. And uh, I'm to talk more about uh, benefits and opportunities. I'll include a few challenges in there. I think the biggest challenge will actually be the scale and pace of this transition. Um, the, the biggest opportunity, your biggest benefit was already alluded to, and, and that is the, the sake of the climate, the sustainability of the planet. All major analyses of, of uh, carbon, uh, dealing with carbon across the world, dealing with roadmaps, uh, decarbonization, so forth, conclude that increased electrification is necessary for decarbonization. So, so it's clear that we're, we need to head in that direction. And there are immense opportunities, but not all electrification is created equal. Uh, a lot of utilities that are still in the throughput model, which is the majority of them, more kilowatt hours equals more revenues, um, look at this as hooray, load growth, happy days are here again. Um, not, not quite. What RAP's picture is to think in terms of beneficial electrification. Now, a whole lot of people can pick their favorite adjective, I understand, but we characterize it as uh, utilities have the opportunity to get a leg up, where by leg we mean, yes, the additional load growth, but also with the caveat that you're saving your customers money and most importantly, providing them additional services because as, as uh, Ashad mentioned, it's not about the electrons going forward, it's about the services. So there's, there's the load growth part, yes, but also one has to keep in mind the environmental benefits. Again, the, the uh, neutrality, fuel neutrality, 
of energy efficiency is a good example here. And those have to be explicit, not just accidental. And then finally, equally explicit, uh, is the character of beneficial electrification to uh, incorporate greater amounts of renewables into the grid to manage the grid better. Uh, and if that isn't explicit, if you're also just thinking about low growth, uh, then you won't reap that benefit. So between low growth environmental benefits and, and grid benefits, you can get a leg up. Uh, there's some really cool things that, uh, that start happening with this. And this is an, uh, some data from EIA, which shows uh, carbon intensity of, of uh, various sectors in the U.S., transportation, commercial, residential, and so forth. And you can see they're all slightly declining. They're all making slow headway since 1975, particularly a little bit recently. But the electric power sector is just seeing the bottom drop out of its carbon intensity. This is wonderful news. And what this means, it's just fascinating, shown in this, this graph uh, by my friends at Exergy, where time is uh, on, the, on the X axis and what we call emissiency, emissions efficiency, not energy efficiency. Again, alluding to Ashad's point about what are the emissions associated with how you are powering this project, in his case, his lawn. Um, we, we have a, a natural gas water heater which, once installed, will operate at the same degree of emissiency, the same performance in terms of CO2 going forward, assuming no degradation. Otherwise, it'll be worse than that. There'll be more emissions. Uh, an electric resistance water heater will, on the other hand, start at some point possibly even dirtier than gas now if you're in a coal-fired uh, uh, fuel mix system. Uh, but that's increasing over time, as the EIA data just showed, such that it will become cleaner and then continue getting cleaner than the natural gas water heater, and a heat pump water heater is even more so. So what this amounts to is that electrified appliances and devices, including vehicles, are the gift that keeps on giving. They get cleaner and cleaner with you having to do nothing to them because the grid's getting cleaner and clearer. This is, this is like compound interest. This is just a fascinatingly positive aspect of where our society is headed. Speaking of where we're headed, let's look at some of the serious forces that are transforming electricity. There are at least four or five exponential forces doing so. And before getting too much into that, let me just come on an exponential. It is another overused adjective. The, the engineers in the room understand what exponential is. The best example in day-to-day -day life is probably Moore's Law, which is why you don't buy a computer this year, because you know darn well it's going to be a better one for the same price, or the same one for a lower price next year. That is starting to happen in our energy sector with all of our devices. In two years, it'll cost half as much or be twice as good. Think about the ramifications of that with your devices. One of those exponential uh, forces that we're seeing is just the explosion in grid data. With synchrophasers, with power management units, with feedback and two-way grids, this is an incredible opportunity through which we're defining new learnings on how to manage the grid, where the loads are, why they are, how we can tailor them, and so forth. A second is the entire renewables explosion, uh, which is certainly consistent with those uh, price declines that Moore's Law would suggest. A third is heat pumps, the, the opportunity to heat uh, residences and businesses, not by combusting and generating and manufacturing heat, but simply bringing it from one place into another place. It's like your refrigerator for your house. It doesn't make heat or make cold. It just takes it from outside and puts it in the fridge and exhausts heat back outside. Same thing for your house. They, they make energy. They accomplish the services at two and 300 percent effectiveness, not trying to get close to 100 percent. Three to four, two to three times the performance. And then finally, storage and EVs. Which, which Frank and Arshad alluded to as well. Now, heat pumps and storage and EVs are right squarely in the target zone of electrification, but they make it possible for renewables also to be managed far more effectively. When, when, uh, when renewables are in the negative price zone that Frank mentioned, there are many ways to deal with that duck curve he showed. Uh, one of them is to dump that energy into, into hot water heaters. And if we used all the hot water heaters that we have today for this purpose and made them grid dispatchable, we could double the amount of solar in the country. 
And that's without even replacing the gas ones. So think of the opportunity for grid management that dispatchable grid integrated water heaters can, can provide, just water heaters. Same thing on the EV side, we haven't even gotten there yet. So huge opportunities. And then these things are all wired together through digitization. So they talk to each other and can be managed through algorithms so that you can set and forget. This is just fascinatingly uh, important changes and progressive changes for the industry. Now what, let's look at what the impacts of that might be. This was a And then there's a lot of that that's actually used, but a lot of it's also wasted. We know, all know about Rankin cycles and waste heat and so forth. That's, that's our 2015 situation. What happens if we replace the internal combustion engine with EVs, at least to a large degree? What happens if we replace furnaces with heat pumps? And what happens if our electricity generation is increasingly through solar and wind? Well, then we find ourselves with somewhat more productive energy, but substantially less waste energy. And that is manifest through somewhat more efficient buildings and because there's less energy used and more efficient transportation, also less energy used. Electricity, of course, increases somewhat and no surprise uh, where most of the waste energy came from and now is no longer needed is the fossil sector, which reduces to less than 10% of overall energy consumed. Now, this is Vermont, may not apply to everywhere, may be different ratios, yada, yada, but the character of that will be present in every state and probably every country. I haven't even talked about from the bottom up. This is all top down, and most of our, the prior remarks were also from the system standpoint down. But we're reaching a point where you know local renegades can have their day at, at the energy uh, uh, bar and grill as well. And this this illustration is uh, from the Brooklyn microgrid project, where uh, neighbors are selling solar amongst themselves, uh, selling and, and uh, buying and selling. Uh, and using blockchain to accomplish that, so they're also reducing transaction costs. A similar model with pricing as the driver, a uh, transactive approach, um, was done as long ago as 2008 and 9 in a congested feeder on the Olympic Peninsula. So this isn't, it isn't even rocket science that it's that news. It's just that it hasn't built into penetration yet. A further example of management at the demand level is Nest's new rush hour rewards program. You've, you sign up with this with your cooperating utility. They partnered with Nest. They cool down your house in advance of a peak. They allow you to opt out if you need to, in which case, of course, you pay. You pay you know, critical peak types of charges. But all of this is done, and you'll be comfortable. And if you're not, you can opt out. Um, completely invisible. Uh, I have it on good authority, though I ha actually haven't verified it, that Nest's million or two thermostats in Ontario are also even providing ancillary services to the grid. Uh, again, not even capacity, not energy, just the ancillary services to keep the grid healthy from a demand side on an aggregated basis. Incredible stuff available through digitization. It's not rocket science. We saw it happen with Airbnb. We saw it happen with Uber and Lyft. We saw it happen with Amazon. Why should energy be uh, immune to that? So I think we're looking at a, at a sea change in the power sector. And the most dramatic way I put it, although I recognize this is a little bit down the road, is that for 100 years we have managed supply. We have had a relatively inflexible demand. We've, we've worked generation to meet it. Generation has followed that static load, or whatever load was we generated to meet it. But today, Electricity demand can be managed. It can actually be managed. The penetration of this is not widespread yet. That's just a technology and pricing problem. The ability to do it is here today. So load will actually follow whatever generation is available and cheap and clean. Load will be the driving force going forward. Now wait, if you can manage supply, which we've done for 100 years, and now can manage demand, 
that sounds perilously close to a market. And if you have a market, then what's the need for the regulatory compact? And, and what, indeed, maybe there's an existential question here for regulators. Now, of course, you need some. You need the level playing field and some consumer protections, that sort of thing. But this is, this is sort of uh, pie in the sky sort of imagining. And yet, there's a pretty good sense that cheaper, cleaner, flexible, and secure resources will ultimately rule uh, in a digitized marketplace. Big difference. Now you say, okay, it is pie in the sky. It's going to be someday. But I would suggest to you that let me, let me first just indicate the window of opportunity for utilities this means. Um, it's, it's a chance for utilities to get closer to their customer segments, um, to refocus on efficiency in the services they provide, including behind the meter services on distributed energy resources. Um, it's an opportunity for them to revise their business models. If they don't, they're, you know, they have a reprieve from electrification. If they don't use that reprieve, they're really asking for obsolescence. Whether it's decoupling, whether it's performance-based regulation, whatever it is, it's got to be different because the same old throughput model won't work. Ditto with traditional rate designs and just jacking up fixed charges is also probably not the best answer because that'll uh, encourage folks to bypass as soon as it's economic and go on their own. So utilities should all be getting going on their distribution system planning, carrying capacity, holding capacity, hosting capacity for new renewables, certainly their analytics. What does management of demand, what kind of opportunities does it apply, do they have? And then the whole transactive par uh, paradigm, the prosumer uh, paradigm that, that Frank mentioned. Now risks also loom here too. There are there are those, excuse me, there are those utilities that will continue to, to uh, think the throughput model is the way to go. Um, they will uh, be a stick in the mud that, that may slow down. And it may even be at states levels. Commissions could impose this or, you know, not progress themselves. Remember, PUCs are reactive bodies. They aren't charged with leadership. They are, they are typically uh, uh, jurisprudence or semi-judicial. Judges don't go and innovate. They receive cases and make decisions. So this is a tough place for PUCs to be. There may also be those that try to hitch uh, their, their current interests to the electrification bandwagon. You're in Washington. You all know what Christmas tree legislation is. Uh, you know, electrification's moving. Let's see if we can get our stuff attached to it. So some existing infrastructure will probably be uh, try to be nailed onto the electrification Christmas tree. Watch out for that. Another risk is that transactive energy and storage become economic before all of this stuff happens. Uh, that's, there's Moore's Law coming in again. You know, Nissan is discounting its current leaves uh, because the new ones are coming out with a far better range, on about a third of the price. This is dumping their computers because they know the new ones are going to be better and no one's going to buy the old one. But they're not computers, they're cars. Incredible stuff. And then the regulatory issues that I, that I already alluded to, that we're not well positioned as regulators to lead or uh, lead this charge or prepare for it even. Um, I, I would suggest that as, as much uh, blue sky as this sounds, that there may not even be a whole lot of time. Courtesy of Tony Seba, you, you all have probably seen this. Easter 1900 in New York City, there's not a car to be seen. Easter 19, not, that was in 1900. Easter 1913, just 13 years later, there's not a horse to be seen. It was not a good time in 1900 to invest in liveries. How much of our existing energy infrastructure are we going to continue to build? How much of it will we strand in our next 13 years? And you say, well, all right, that was 1900. That was way back then. Well, let's look at a more recent example, all right? We all grew up with these, or at least a lot of us did. Some of us even grew up with rotary dial. I didn't want to go that far back, even a party line. But this has been a societal changing instrument. And most of you know, it just celebrated its 10th birthday this summer. That's all I got. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. And I'd be pleased with this panel to answer any questions. Thank you.
Aww. Okay, well, my favorite part of that was not the absence of the horses uh, at the end, but uh, Ken Colburn basically going after his regula regulator colleagues, <laughs> questioning whether they'd be uh, uh, needed in the future, which I think is great. Um, okay, I want to ask a few questions of the group, and then we'll open it up for conversation. Uh, one of the things that I started off with for the reason that we were doing uh, this particular topic is there's a certain group uh, or area where you have conversations where climate change is a primary driver and people are very concerned and or envisioning futures that are fundamentally low carbon. And I, I, I very much subscribe to that view, but I just wanted to start because I think each of you sort of had that as a potential driver or an issue within the vision that you put forward, Arshad, you probably did that a little bit the least. Does electrification still happen in the way that you're envisioning if climate change isn't not a driver, but it's certainly not being driven on the order of magnitude that gets you to a two degree target? Does, does electrification still happen in the way that you envision? Not everybody has to answer, but if you want to answer that. I think um, it will happen much slower. Uh, if you look at, I'd go to, go to Georgia, actually Savannah, they have a seaport that they completely electrified and Southern Company is actually focusing a lot on electrification in Dorag and um, different regions will have different drivers. Um, I'll give you another example, EVs. Uh, many people think, and that's the right reason, that Europe and China and other countries uh, banning gasoline vehicles is the driver for EV. It's actually another big driver. The car manufacturers want to make autonomous vehicles, driver-assisted vehicles. And how, what does that got to do with EV? Well, an EV allows you to control the vehicle in a much more precise way than an ICE engine. So they see EV as a way to get to driver-assisted vehicles, and that's driving them. So there are other drivers besides climate change or emissions reduction. However, those drivers don't have the scale and breadth that you have on the emission reduction. Um, sure, I'd, I'd say yes, and let me be further sacrilegious uh, about my, uh, my, my past or my role. I was an air guy, and uh, yet we have seen uh, the clean power plant essentially set aside uh, with our change of administration. So it probably won't proceed forward, and if it does, it certainly won't be on the same basis that it was intended or planned. But you know what? The emissions reductions that it was going to secure are running ahead of schedule. Why? Because of these technologies. It's not that people want to do or don't do electrification. It's these technology opportunities are reducing their costs and, and increasing their opportunities. So they're happening. So the clean power plan says this air guy may not even be necessary. That's one anecdote. A second is, I had occasion recently to drive a Tesla S that belonged to a friend. I expected it's an $80,000, $85,000 car. I expected a nice luxury car experience. What I didn't expect was the gestalt of the feeling that I was being safely and comfortably transported to my destination. And then it parked too. It led me to the conclusion that nobody would say no to this option if they had a price choice about it. So that, the price is technology. Technology is Moore's law. It's just a question of which doubling is it before you can afford it, and you will say yes. So I think that without climate as the main driver, we might end up electrifying in a much more sensible manner, <laughs> actually. Um, so electrification is you know, separate from climate, uh, so many of the technologies that we have allow the system to um, function more efficiently, to deliver the service more efficiently, more thoughtfully, more resilient, uh, with more resiliency. Um, I personally am less bullish on uh, your vision, Ken, of the kind of uh, ubiquitous agent, individual, residential level kind of uh, vision. And I'll tell you why, because unlike the cell phone, where you know, we paid 600 bucks for this, it cost 200 bucks to make. Nobody pays 600 bucks for energy when it costs 200 bucks to make because there's no, it's a commodity. And I think uh, as we go to greater 
uh, electrification and moving technologies more broadly, the, you know, the actual costs are going to have to be, uh, to be dealt with. And um, so we're, we're going through that transition. I mean, there, is, uh, there, there, there are further gains to be made, certainly, but I don't think it's going to be as straightforward. Without that, though, I think, um, you know, you will see, or regardless of that, you will see um, utilities and system operators looking to these new technologies today and implementing them where they can because they, they do make technical sense in many instances. Okay, so you uh, jumped the queue in the questions I was going to ask, but I think that's a good order to go in. You just mentioned, Frank, that uh, electricity is a commodity and it's one for which its value is negative in some places, in some cases, right? And so we're talking about a future in which more people are consuming energy services through electricity. Uh, and that the business model has to change in some way, shape, or form to sort of make all of that possible. You're in hearing in increasing circles, you know, this phrase, energy is the new oil, or, or excuse me, information is the new oil, or information is the new energy, or something like that, right? And I am still trying to grapple with what that means. What is the business model for companies that are having to change their, the way that they approach a world in which there's more electrification, but where the the access to the home and the information in the home is supposedly more valuable than the electricity that they're selling to the home. I mean, I, it's a very complex con concept. We had a discussion here with the people in Germany not too long ago who were going through Energy Vende and talking about, you know, as you were, Ken, you know, managing the demand side of the ledger and not having to worry about supply security anymore and all of those sorts of things. But it's really hard to envision who are, who are the businesses that win in that business model and do we know the answer to that question yet? Because I think it gets to another issue that I want to talk about in a little bit, which is the politics of all of this. Right? I mean, energy and infrastructure and energy is an incumbent business, and it's really hard to see if you can't precisely put a finger on who wins and who's making money and who anchors the business model, how all of this works. Anybody? Uh, just, uh, and that's actually some of the, so we think the, you, when you sell electricity, you're not going to get any more value than lighting or light. That's the value. But what the opportunity is, and this is a contrarian from what Frank was saying, I think transactive energy opens the door for electric utilities to be actually offering customer solutions that are grid integrated. Give me an example. Let's say I'm, I'm, I live in Florida and went through Irma. And I say, you know, I need an emergency generator. And if I, go to, I can go to Home Depot and buy one, maybe $2,500 with another $500 installation, $3,000. Let's say my utility says, yes, you can buy that, but here are four brands that we have teamed up with. They are integrated with my utility operations. And by the way, I would need to use them no more than 10 times a year. And you can now have a $1,000 rebate for doing that. I would jump in a heartbeat to take that offer. But in, now from the utilities perspective, who pays that $1,000 that I got a rebate? That's the value to the grid. So all the rate payers are paying for it. So utilities are not just now selling electricity, they're actually selling value-added value -added solutions which are grid integrated because as a utility, why would you sell a water heater? Well, there are water heater manufacturers who should be selling water heaters. But you as a utility can define the interface and the cyber requirements. And then if I choose one of those water heaters, I get a free water heater. If you do the 10 year life cycle of a water heater and look at the present value, you could actually get a free water heater if that type of regulatory compact and IT infrastructure is possible. Um, what Ashad just suggested is spot on and in fact has already happened. Great River Energy uh, recently through one of its distribution cooperative members um, offered a solar panel which normally runs about a thousand dollars to members for two hundred dollars but the catch was they had to also take a new grid integrated water heater you okay with that yes most members were and, they, and the, what those water heaters did was exactly what Ashard said uh, I, I think he's uh, in exactly the right direction and the way I would characterize it to further the uh, analogy with cooperatives, uh, which I have an affinity for being served by one and on NRECA's board is the trusted energy advisor. 
utility's strongest suit will be their relationship with customers, not their specific technologies or let alone their specific kilowatt hours. And if I don't know what's going on in this mess, recall telephone deregulation? None of us knew what to do. I don't, I don't know what to do. I know who to turn to at least. And that's uh, uh, Shard's folks. That's, that's the business model I see. Uh, so I, I should be clear, Shard. I actually, what I was suggesting with sensible electrification is exactly what you said. That's a valuable, but there's a trade-off there. That isn't, you, everybody has a system. That may not be the right option. So I think that's important. But that's absolutely the case, right? Because these technologies enable service delivery that's more sensible, more cost-effective, more spatially uh, kind of attuned, and so on. Um, <clears throat> with that said, I think the broader issue of kind of value, real value, I think that remains opaque. So if you look at the big data companies that are increasingly involving themselves in this business, so Google or Alphabet with Nest and so on, so they're gathering a lot of information, and that's interesting. And they're certainly looking at these opportunities, and certainly where the regulatory frameworks make sense, you can offer ancillary services with your aggregated, uh, aggregated systems. You can see that working for a while. But where I really ask, or where I kind of struggle, is where the capital that's going to be required to make all of that happen, where that comes from. Because from a, from a B-School point of view, the, uh, the, the rate of, you know, of uh, return on invested capital is utterly different in that market versus the, uh, the, the digital markets that we're seeing today. So I think that remains unclear. People are trying to explore that. And people are making cases and making businesses and often making a lot of noise based in many instances on artificial extra market kind of regulation and so on. I'm not sure that's yet ubiquitously relevant. So both of you have just said something uh, that are issues we haven't really talked about, but get to one of them was the word cyber and the other one is the, the term value, right? And so uh, I was a huge fan of the Quadrennial Energy Review. I like the idea of, you know, trying to figure out the value of different component pieces of the electricity system and how to value those things. And so we had a lot of conversations here about that. Um, and we've, so one of the, one of the, core questions I've got about these visions, right, is, is it fundamentally more reliable or does it bring in new vulnerabilities? And so to me, that's, that's a question on two levels. One, uh, we've got a current administration that is apparently very concerned about reliability. Uh, uh, and so this question of whether or not relying more on the electric power sector for uh, energy services rather than less is, uh, seems to be a legitimate public policy issue that we're going to discuss for the next 19 days uh, and then somewhere thereafter. Um, it, but, it does, but that's not the only value, clearly. That's one of the things that they're trying to put a value on, uh, uh, certainly in the wholesale power markets. The second is um, uh, cybersecurity. Uh, you know, you think about the way that we are or are not managing that issue right now and the way that sensors and all these wonderful gee whiz, you know, sort of technologies are uh, influencing our life. Is this, have we solved that issue such that we're okay to sort of full bore run into this vision of the future uh, and feel like we're less vulnerable than we otherwise would be? Uh. Epre should be jumping at that question. Um, <laughs> I will. <laughs> so, um, well, we've obviously defined what reliability is worth. Yeah. And, and I can assure you that, uh, you know, 90 days worth of coal isn't a real cyber risk, I guess. So, you know, it'd be hard to hack it. But, um, you know, I think honestly, I think honestly the, the cyber issue remains in flux. I think that, um, I think that clearly we're moving towards a system that is going to be inherently more vulnerable. There are going to be more, uh, more opportunities, at least, to get into the system. I mean, if you, take, if you take rooftop solar as an example, you know, all of those, you know, increasingly those systems have smart meters. They all have an IP address. So there are a million of those systems, 1.25 million of those systems sitting on rooftops. That is a way into the system that's just popped up. Um, and I think we just have to acknowledge that, uh, you know, there is a trade-off here between the risks and the benefits. I think that where, where we have a big problem is kind of in terms of the, the kind of the regulatory structures and the kind of coordination of rules and regulations regarding this. Mm -hmm. And before talking about the future and the problems, I mean, we have that problem today. Um, you know, a lot of the value that we've just been speaking about is only possible through having transparency with respect to individuals' data. 
and in many in many jurisdictions today, you are not actually allowed to have that data. I mean, researchers uh, like me, we're trying to get our hands on information on kind of uh, you know individual agent data usage from various states. Don't talk to us. That's not that's not available. So you know, until we overcome those basic issues, I think we have a problem. So I think we have a problem on data on enablement, and I think we also have a problem on data on vulnerability. Um, but uh, but to the extent to what uh, you know, to the extent that that can be mitigated, I'm confident it can. Uh, but I, I'm sure that the industry has a has a more keen insight into that. I think I think cyber will never solve it, yeah. and it's not something that you solve completely, but. If technology advances while cyber becomes an issue and it has to be addressed, we will move to a new system. I you look at banking industry. Is cyber not an issue? Absolutely. But have they not completely gone into an IT-based banking system? Yes, they have. When you created ATM machines, which was actually IT-enabled, isn't there more risk for somebody to steal money from one ATM machine than from a central bank, which is well-guarded? Yes, but you can steal a lot of money from one ATM machine. When you go into a distributed world, you do have that example. Yes, you can breach into the water heater and turn on or turn off the water heater, but actually a distributed resource gives you more resiliency in terms of cyber. The entire DOD, if you look at our warfare today, it is enabled by IT. Has it increased the vulnerability? Maybe it has, but because of technology. So I don't think cyber will prevent us from where technology is going to take us. What we'll have to do is we'll have to be more prudent, we'll have to take the right measures, and we'll have to continue to work on reducing the risk. And I, I just add to that very consistent with Ashard's uh, view. We, there are more vulnerabilities, there's no question about that, but nature also evolves strength through diversity, and there's vastly more diversity. So each individual risk will be pretty moderate. You know, my water heater goes out, what's it mean to society? Um, it, it's a problem, but I don't see any of this flow stopping. So as Ashad and Frank said, we'll have to do it on the way. One of the interesting things is, I think this is another service that utilities can offer. Mm -hmm. Certainly in terms of uh, energy security, the IRMAs and microgrid and islanding capability, and in a parallel fashion, security, cybersecurity risks uh, that individuals face as well. It's a service. Uh, okay, I've got two more questions, but I want to open it up to the group, so I'm going to give you both at the same time, and you can answer which ones y you want. Um, we talked a lot about EVs, and I think that electric vehicles is the, is the sector through which electrification is happening that people are most comfortable talking about. So I'd, I'd love to go into each individual sector, but let's stay there for a minute. Because one of the things I'm wondering is you're starting to see a proliferation of policies that are about banning internal combustion engines or enabling only electric vehicle sales by date certain, some of those being companies, some of those being governments. And what's interesting is it seems to be, whether you think they're possible or not, a way of driving an answer to this chicken and an egg problem, which is, do you build the infrastructure first and then they get the cars, you do get the cars first and then you build the infrastructure. It's trying to build some certainty into that. But it's a fairly abrupt or blunt tool for doing that. Do you see that we're going to be replicating more policies like that in other sectors to drive electrification in the same way, or is that something that's unique to transportation? So that's one question. The second question is on just the pure politics of all of this. Um, you mentioned the Christmas tree, uh, Ken and, and Frank, you mentioned sort of behavioral economics. Um, one of the things that I find interesting is that a lot of this vision is driven by, uh, by the way, Ken, I think you're the only person to use the word gestalt in all of the time that I've been here. Uh, so congratulations for that too. It is by this gee whiz factor, right? By the fact that you want to walk in and say to whatever the woman's name is on the little the you know uh, uh, device. Hey, turn on my radio. You know those sorts of things. It, the sort of behavioral aspect, the additional value aspect. Is that going to be enough to override the politics of of what we're seeing right now, which is a circular firing squad within power generation circles to say, no, 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 no. I want to be the one to provide the electricity and I've got the infrastructure and here's how you have to keep me whole. So one on the types of policies that we're seeing and the other just sort of on, uh, on, the, on the politics of everything. 
I, I guess as a policy guy, I should at least take a whack at it. Huh? Um, I, I worry about the policies uh, to a significant degree because, as, as Frank said, if, if we hold on this, we may be able to do it more intelligently. <laughs> and and I, I suspect that almost everybody in the room would suggest that at least where there are functioning markets, uh, they ought to be allowed to function and they'll function better than policy interventions. Um, so if we can get to that point, by all means, let's get to it. Uh, what's necessary to get to that point, I'm not yet convinced um, that public policies are necessary too far to drive EVs because the technology and the <laughs> that gestalt is, and, and the self-driving parts are, are driving pretty, pretty hard themselves. Um, imagine, for example, sending your kids off to school or you're an elderly driver who can't drive anymore, but, you know, autonomous vehicles, you now have options. Um, so there are some, some significant societal drivers independent of states creating RPSs for EVs uh, or companies doing so. Um, so I'd like to say no. Um, there's an additional con complication too, which is even if uh, a state says thou shalt have so many EVs and then that drives how many charging stations and the charging stations are intimately tied to rate design because they have a high, uh, high load, high instantaneous demand and low capacity factor. Um, that's okay, we can deal with that, but we haven't dealt with it, and it's not easy to deal with, especially in commissions that may not have that same vision for this many EVs, or how it should roll out, or the timetable. Um, the thing I continue to fear is that this is not a when we get around to it issue. This is a situation where technology will drive bypass on almost every front. So where public policy doesn't act, um, individuals will and markets will. The, the question is which will be better, um, I'm not sure. I think today, if you, so sticking with, let's say, the policy surrounding EVs to begin with, I think, um, uh, actually, I mentioned Norway in my remarks. Norway is interesting because <laughs> they've been so successful with their policies that they're now kind of entering into that phase where they are trying to rethink their policies. And there is, of course, a big backlash. And so you have this kind of circularity surrounding that that I think is a big issue. Um, I, tend to, I, I tend to subscribe, actually, to the vision that we're going to see you know, the adoption of EVs take place without any particular uh, need for a lot of intervention, given how, that, uh, given how that technology is progressing, and crucially, given the rate at which the, the, the object turns over. So let's say between now and 2050, we have two or three fleet, maybe three or four fleet turnovers available, and there's, be, there's going to be a lot of new technology uh, available, and I think we're going to see adoption quite broadly. I think you have to, you know, um, uh, our friends in China, in Beijing, have, uh, and more broadly in China, they are pushing EVs in, in some instances as well, and for air quality issues and so on. They're going to run into a big issue with respect to the lack of infrastructure, actually, for their charging. So, you know, we have to be kind of careful about you know, what's, the, what's the outcome. On the, on, the, uh, on the electrification of other sectors, I think that's more complicated. I think that may be a place where if you wanted to do something very meaningful, then maybe you do require a mandate because you know, electrifying refineries, for example. We don't build very many refineries to begin with. I think the economics are quite challenging. Uh, and so, and, and the turnover is very, very low. So if those sectors are going to be addressed and the potential that they have on paper is to be realized, then I think you're actually going to have to take a more, uh, a more kind of policy-driven approach there. Building codes. Yes, building codes, exactly. I'm, not, not on those, just uh, you mentioned about that little Alexa thing that we have in our house. Alexa and whether pe Alexa, Siri, whether people will embrace it. I say, look at demographics. I've got two daughters four years apart. The youngest one, everything she does is through Alexa. Alexa, remind me five hours from now to feed the dog. Alexa, and she's doing, when she searches, she doesn't type anything. She just opens Siri and say, you know, ask a question while she's doing the homework. Just four years younger than my other daughter, and she is more regular. So I think as we see in 50 years demographics changing, just like fleet changing, these technologies that provide value, we don't even know that a Snapchat that produces pictures has a $10 billion value. But apparently it does because a lot of those demographics, they're using Snapchat. 
So I think what value means to consumers, if we just use our demographics or even our next demographics to answer that question, most likely every time we'll answer it wrong. I'm so not a first mover. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to open it up to the audience. Uh, please state your name and affiliation question in the form of a question and wait for a mic. I'm going to take three at a time because we only have 15 minutes. We'll start with the Honorable Adam Siminski. Adam, Adam Smetsky, CSIS, formerly the Energy Information Administration. So I, I never thought uh, that as an energy information person that I would want to know more about horse statistics. But this image of horses in New York keeps coming. It's everywhere I go. That's the, the meme. Is that the right word for early adopters? <laughs> so, I have a, so I actually did a little look up on horse statistics, the maximum horse population in the United States was around 1920, 1925, but it actually took 25, it took from 19, so the, the car came in between 1910 and 1920, but it took horses going away uh, about another 25 years. And, and the map that, that Frank put up is an interesting one because what they said about horses was they went out of New York like immediately because that was a value proposition. You didn't have to buy the horse, you didn't have to clean up after the horse, you didn't have to stable the horse, and, uh, and so that was a, like provided value. Um, so the question is, and, and the, the map that you put up shows the cities, the coasts, are adopting the electric car, but in the countryside, they're not yet. And so the next statistic I need to look up, and I haven't done it yet, but maybe somebody here knows, is how many cars are there in that middle part of the country where, so like Oklahoma has a lot, there's a lot of cars in Oklahoma, per, but maybe they're not going to adopt electric cars. So if we want to know how quickly gasoline is going to be replaced, we need to know more than just New York City. We need to know more about the rest of the country. So that's my question. What do we know about the places outside of the cities where there are still a lot of vehicles and how quickly they're going to adopt electric vehicles? Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, we'll go to Bill, and then we had one right here. And then we'll do another round. Bill Eichert, consultant, um, and formerly with a electric, California Electric Utility some years ago. So. Um, Question, sort of combination of regulatory with technology. Microgrids, you mentioned microgrids and having microgrids present at the same time of, as integrated grids. And, and, but my question kind of goes around, okay, who pays? And I think one of the underlying questions, if you look at the regulatory environment, is who pays for the current system? Who pays for stranded pieces of the system? Who pays for the new system? I, I'd like you to, because I think at the end, of the end of the day, a lot of the resistance to the technology, and sometimes the resistance from the utilities, you know, who may be selling the tech, you know, ultimately in the position of selling the technology, is how to make that transition and how to do so in a way so they don't left, get left holding the bag, but at the same time there's sort of a uh, cooperation with the consumer. So I, I'd like you to address that sort of series of questions. Um, uh, Elliot Roseman, um, private consultant. I want to like to uh, ask about the implications for the uh, for the grid. There were several references to uh, to grid management, but there's a number of folks who think that there is not going to be nearly as much need for investment in transmission. Other folks think that there, we need to bolster it, and it is a foundation and it is a starting point to enable all of the other investments, and that needs to be actually more invested in and bolstered. So I'd like to ask the question about you know what is the future of the transmission, the wholesale grid? Clearly, I think we're going to need to be bolstering the distribution system as we have more devices at the distribution level and more circuits and breakers and other things that are needed in order to accommodate the two-way communications. But what happens to the, uh, the overall network? So I would sort of, we can get to another round of questions. Not everybody has to answer everything. So would anybody like to take Adam's question, not about where the horses went, but what about the cars in the middle part of the country? Frank? So, um, Adam, you know, I showed a graph there speaking about, you know, the range of mobility services that today's technology can, uh, 
can deliver, and that's a CDF. The problem with that is that everybody has a kind of long tail with respect to what they want to do with their, with their, uh, with their car. So a, long, a much longer trip than 99% of their trips look like. And I think that's one of the hurdles. That's less of an issue in cities, turns out, where uh, you know, the, the profile of driving is, is different. But in, you know, in, in more rural areas, that kind of the, the profile required is, um, has more of that tail. And I think that you, know, uh, you have a problem then with respect to delivering a service with today's technologies, or even tomorrow's technologies, that's as equivalent as what they have from the utility of today's vehicle. So I think you know, the, the adoption there is going to be kind of more, more complex. Ken, maybe you could talk about, because you brought up stranded assets on your last slide, who, who pays? Who pays for the transition? What are the costs? Well, I, I think it's, it's a completely open question, and, and you, know, you raise it well and for all the right reasons, but it's frankly too early to tell. Um, there are now a lot of state regulatory agencies that are recognizing the need to embark on grid modernization. It used to be just New York Rev. But now it's on the order of 10 states that are figuring out that times are changing and they need to at least keep up with them, if not lead them. Um, <clears throat> that needs to happen before you can figure out what's left behind and what their cost, you know, what, how much cost is being stranded. That needs to be determined before you can figure out who pays. Um, you know, it, commissions don't have a, um, a very strong legacy of, um, ruling investments imprudent and uh, so if one had to bet one would anticipate that ratepayers will have to pay or at least the lion's share the problem now is that i think bypass will be a, a really viable opportunity in the not too distant future especially i mean storage is obviously the key but you saw frank's graphs on storage so uh, how and when even even large segments of the population, certainly not everyone, because this will be an economic issue, can simply say, to hell with you, grid, I'm, I'm going away. Um, could have a material effect on how the rest of this plays out. Well, but, but technologically, I think it will happen. Well, certainly some implications for people who can't afford to bypass the grid, uh, for sure. Okay, Arshad, would you like to talk about the transmission question? I think what you'll see on the transmission side is uh, the need for transmission and why we build transmission has changed over the last 10, 15 years. You know, if you look at the fork ruling on terms of enabling renewables, so if you have a wind farm where the load is not there, you got to build transmission to bring it. But if you look at, I think we would be, if I look at a 50, 2050 time frame, Right now, today in the U.S., 20% of the energy that we use is electricity. It took us 120 years to go from zero to 20. If I take 1893 Chicago Warfare, that was the city of light, Edison and Westinghouse duked it out and somebody won. It took us 120 years to get to 20% electrification. If we are correct in where we see technologies going and if they're enabling policy, we are looking at what will it take to be 50% by 2050. But that doesn't mean when we go from 20% to 50%, which is more than double, you need more than double than existing transmission that we have. You still need more, but I think we'll be using the assets much more smartly, and overall energy need will come down. Okay, I'm gonna try one more round, but it's gonna be lightning, like right here, and then right here. You're gonna have to be quick. Carla Frisch, Department of Energy. This is to Sarah's point about decarbonization at the federal level being a temporarily backseat, but still urgent policy driver. But one policy driver we are discussing is the use of domestic resources. And I didn't hear anyone in the panel say that electricity is inherently a domestic resource. And I wonder what your opinion is about highlighting electricity as a domestic resource. Great. Uh, right here. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, and I'm a master's student at Johns Hopkins Science. Uh, so you all mentioned uh, the rapid change of technology, and my question is how does different stakeholders handle technology obsolescence? Like for example, if I take the electric vehicle section, uh, investing in electric vehicle charging would be entirely different for a fleet setup rather than for like, uh, like an autonomous fleet would be very different from a normal driver's. Uh, how does regulators think about wireless charging? Would that change people's perspectives? Would uh, 
different ranges, Im improve the need for electric vehicle charging infrastructure with that different uh, differentiate what's needed and what's actually not. Thank you. That's a big question. I'm sorry everyone couldn't hear, but it was about how people deal with technology obsolescence in periods of change, right, and how to prepare for, you know, not picking a suboptimal uh, uh, technology and preparing for the different kinds. Okay, we'll do Jan and then over there. Hi, I'm Jan Mayer's Resources for the Future. The title of your uh, talk about an integrated energy network implies, and everything you said, is we're going to have a much more extensive you know, network across our country, which means we've got smart people and dumb people. And when you look at all of the cyber issues that have happened, where we just where all the computers at Aramco were destroyed, where missiles in Korea have been destroyed, where centrifuges in Iran have been destroyed. What is your real level of confidence we can handle such a situation? I think by dumb people, you mean dumb people who do things like download things on their computers and make cyber surfaces. Um, I might be one of those. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, Chase Counts, Energy Solutions. Uh, my question is really about, uh, are you aware of any efforts to quantify the value of health and safety benefits of electrification um, at any level? And more specifically, I'm thinking, uh, it's kind of granular, but uh, residential water heater, gas water heater, um, electrifying that eliminates the potential for carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, asthma, um, other issues. Uh, so we've got a few questions there. Who wants to take the value of uh, domestic, the domesticness of electricity? Well, I mean, you know, the vast majority of our electricity resource is domestic uh, to begin with, has been for a long, long time, um, and I think increasingly so. I think there's an interesting, perhaps bigger question about in this transition, can the United States uh, establish itself as a kind of leader in the kind of development of this technology uh, and the integration of it into the kind of uh, economy more broadly? Um, and I think we're not, we're not making, you know, certain states are trying to support that and so on. I think there's greater opportunity. I know EPRI are very keen to kind of support this. I think there's a huge, huge opportunity there. Uh, and that's a, bigger, that's a bigger advantage, or that, that's perhaps a bigger story than the fuel, fuel resource mix itself. Can you give a shout out to the Canadians, though, part of the electricity network? Okay, um, and then we've got a question about obsolescence. Uh, which future are we planning for? I mean, if you can envision it, right, you can plan for it. We don't have to worry about picking the wrong technology, right? Yeah, that, that's a tough one. I should take it because you asked about how are states approaching this, but I don't, I don't think that they are. Um, before commissions are usually the currently interested parties, not the technology developers. Um, so they may be slightly less ready for a blind left hook, but only slightly. Um, and and I, I just don't see them making those plans. Perhaps I don't understand the question well, we could talk after, but uh, I don't have good news for you about the care and, and uh, analysis going into yeah. those kinds of questions. Can, can I just add one thing? So uh, an important example for me locally at, in Massachusetts about obsolescence and the risk of obsolescence. So Massachusetts, uh, the PUC there, I think, are being extremely cautious about uh, supporting the rollout of smart meters because they're super concerned about that being a stranded asset in five years' time. That's a huge hindrance, of course, to us doing things smarter. So there's a chicken and egg problem here that I think exists in several places that we have to get over. Otherwise, what we're talking about here becomes quite moot. Mm -hmm. Then I guess maybe user error risk uh, on an integrated network and, and the um, quantification of health benefits. Well, I think the cyber was a good question. I think we would be spending a lot more on cyber than what we're spending now. And um, we're seeing the trend already that's happening. Um, having said that, there is a case to be made that when you have a vastly distributed system, not necessarily your cyber risk goes up at the same level. It does go up. Iran centrifuge is a great example. It wasn't a connected system, but there were equipment over there that had built-in cybersecurity vulnerability. So I think just uh, cyber will be a core competency. It already is for all energy companies, just like it's for banking, just like it's for defense. And uh, on the uh, health benefits question, uh, I don't, most of those efforts are still somewhat on the periphery. Um, 
uh, Paul Epstein did a lot of work at Harvard School of Public Health. His, his folks uh, still operating there do a pretty good job of that. World, um, is it World Bank? Um, no, the World Health people. Mm -hmm. uh, well, WHO is, uh, does a fair amount of that work. Um, it hasn't been incorporated while there's still externalities as far as state commissions go, so a long way to go. And if I can just insert on Carla's question too, uh, we talk about domestic resources thinking usually uh, coal and gas, but uh, our wind and our sunlight are pretty domestic too. And uh, they've been doing pretty well lately. So. Well, we are about uh, at, the, at the close of the hour. I think there's a lot more to talk about within each of the sectors of the economy that we're talking about electrifying. We haven't even talked about indoor ag, uh, EVs we could talk about all day, every day, which I think a lot of people are doing now these days. Um, and increasingly, you know, you brought it up at, uh, when you were talking, Arshad, but I, I do think there's a valid question as to how developed economies are approaching electrification versus places that are developing anew and whether they're just going to be fundamentally more electrified uh, than the existing systems that we see in most developed economies. We'll, we'll come back and do more of this and hopefully you guys will join us. But I just please thank uh, Arshad and Frank and Ken for being here with us today. Thanks.